is it is it next and back? Is that set up to go? Next and back. Thank you. We're just gonna let we're gonna let the last Okay. I'm not going to call them stragglers at the back, but the last few people to grab their food and grab a seat, then we can get going. They, um, it's great to see so many people here today. They, um, there's not many cities in Britain where you get turnouts like this at lunchtime uh, to discuss the economic strategy of the city, so that is a good sign of progress. We did have a free lunch, though. <laughs> right, some of us are being nice about Manchester. If you want to start running it down, that's your, you know, that's your prerogative. Right, OK, let's get started. The, um, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution uh, Foundation. And we're here today to talk about the role of Greater Manchester in the British economy. Which is a slightly different perspective from how often these debates start, which is starting from the perspective of Greater Manchester or the North West, or if you're at some of these events, some particular parts of Greater Manchester. We're starting from a question, which is sort of a, a view, which is that Britain needs Greater Manchester to succeed. They, um, they, that is our starting point. They, um, and we are coming to that view as part of the Economy 2030 inquiry, which is a now nearly three year long piece of work, where there'll be about 60, 70 reports by the time it finishes on the 4th of December, date in your diary, anyone that fancies a trip to London, they, um, uh, on what the future of the UK economy and the UK economic strategy should be, because you might have noticed it's not going that well. They, um, so how do, how do we get growth up across the United Kingdom and how do we get inequality down is the premise of that work. That's funded by the Nuffield Foundation and it's a joint piece of work between ourselves at the Resolution Foundation and the London School of Economics. But so today we're talking about where does Greater Manchester fit into that national economic strategy? What is the plausible route to Greater Manchester being a more productive, richer city? And if that did happen, who would benefit? How would those benefits be shared? How could policy make a difference to who uh, benefited? Well, just one last bit of preamble before we get going, because we've got a great panel to go through, is what the starting point from a more parochial perspective is that Greater Manchester has obviously seen a lot of success. Yeah. And you hear this a lot down in London town. People being like, oh, I, I went up to Manchester the other day, and there's a lot of cranes there, which is obviously the only measure of economic progress anyone can cope with. Uh, there, there's a lot of cranes. Uh, there's even some tall buildings. Lots of people say there's too many tall buildings. We're in one of them. Uh, sometimes they say that's a good thing. But the next thought, and it's not always said, but often the next thought is, so it's job done. Right? So basically, or an even more extreme version of job done, which is it's gone too far. Right. The Great Manchester is now too successful. We need to worry about other parts of the country or other parts of the North West. And actually, it might be a problem if Greater Manchester did too well. The, um, and I think, although that question of complacency or job done, um, whether that is right in the British context is like a large part of what we want to make sure we talk a bit today. Now, our, to cards on the table, our view is that it's complete nonsense. And could people please not measure economic progress by cranes? Henry will say that more politely because he's an academic in a second. But like, that, that is our starting point. But I think that is worth wrestling with. And that is different in Greater Manchester to other parts of the country. The, um, that's one of the big differences. People have seen big progress. Some people feel ambivalent about that. Some people think that's great, but we don't need to do any more. And the question is, do we? And if we do, what is a plausible way to make that progress happen? So in terms of how we discuss that, you've got a great panel. So first of all, Henry Overman, there, who is one of the authors of this report and a professor of economic geography at the London School for Economics. No booze for the word London. It's not his fault. We all make lifestyle choices. There um, uh, is going to give you a summary of a report we published today on exactly what I just said. What, would it, what is the plausible route to Greater Manchester being significantly more productive in the next 20 years. And we are talking here about an economic strategy in about 20 years. We're not talking about people pretending, oh, if you just have like this particular power devolved, or if you just have like, you know, one other bit of transport policy changed or something else, that everything suddenly, you know, magically gets fixed. It's a long game economic development, which I'm sure everyone uh, understands. So Henry's going to give us a short presentation of that report first of all, and then you're going to hear from uh, Bev Craig, who's obviously the leader of Manchester City Council, but also leads for the Combined Authority on economic development. So if anyone's having an economic strategy, it's Bev. The, um, uh, as we said, 
we think Greater Manchester success is a necessary um, part of Britain returning to something that looks like economic uh, success. So you're then going to hear from Will Garton, who's the Director General for Leveling Up at the Department for, wait for it, Leveling Up Housing and Communities. You can never have enough titles in a department's uh, name. The, um, and then you're going to hear from Jen Williams, who's the Northern England correspondent, correspondent at the Financial Times and does a brilliant job of making sure that the pink newspaper has some coverage in it with the word Manchester. <coughs> Sometimes other parts of the North. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Although, do they ever moan that you're like clearly biased? I'm trying really hard not to be actually. Okay, I mean, we all. We, we shouldn't we'll, really be here now. <laughs> you should be here. But it's a great audience. <laughs> right, anyway, so that is the plan. Now, hopefully, you're going to ask some questions. If you want to ask them on Slido, then it's hashtag Greater Manchester, a really imaginative hashtag. Well done, team. The, um, uh, so put them on there, or if you want to ask them in the room, there are some mics. So can you raise your hand when we get to that part of the discussion? Mm. Everyone clear on the plan? Great. Let's get going. So, Henry, over to you. What's in the report? I've learned my lesson about stepping carefully when getting down from stages. Uh, so, let me, uh, let me talk you through this. Um, obviously, this is a 10, 12 minute presentation of uh, a huge project led by Lindsay Judge and, uh, and a team of people uh, at Resolution Foundation LSE, so we wouldn't be here without all, all the hard work they have uh, put in. And obviously I can only gloss the surface here, and I hope we're going to get into some of the sort of details in the discussion that we're going to have uh, together. So we're interested in a plausible path to greater prosperity, and this plausible is going to be uh, important. Uh, as we go along, and uh, this is part of a two-pronged two uh, thing where some of what we've done is talking about Birmingham, and today we're here to talk about Manchester, hence the tale of two cities. So what, uh, what's the task? Here is the task as we see it. The task is to make Grand Greater Manchester function more effectively than it currently does as a city region. With different parts of the region successfully playing a role in that and acknowledging that they're going to play different roles, just like different parts of the national economy play different roles. Uh, and that uh, that's going to put together support and attract high value firms and the high skilled workers that are going to work for those firms. All right, so that we think is the task. And I'm going to give you a little bit about how we think we would pull various policy levers to get there. And the aim is to, the goal is to reduce the productivity gap between the city and London from 35% to 20%. It's kind of arbitrarily chosen, but it also happens to be the gap between Paris and Lyon. Right? So we're looking internationally and saying, well, look, there's a country which people often point to for having narrower spatial disparities than us, so let's set that as a goal. I'm going to give you some quite precise numbers. This is a, a caveat I'm going to make right now. It's all spurious precision. All right? It is here to give you a feeling for the magnitude of the challenge we face. You should not take any of these numbers too seriously. We're at the strategic level. Lots of work would be done locally to take these numbers into a concrete plan uh, for what happens in the city. Okay, so let's start with, um, you know, the idea about what we think firms in Manchester need to be doing differently to narrow this productivity gap. And this slide here basically allows us to make three points. The first is, if you look at the left-hand side, that plots the productivity in firms, okay, the distribution of productivity in firms in Greater Manchester. Birmingham and cities in the Greater South East. And you see those things sit on top of one another, right? So in local services, what we might think of as the foundational economy, productivity in our, in our firms looks pretty similar across uh, the three major cities. Now, that doesn't say doing stuff in these, player, in these uh, sectors is not important. And, uh, you know, actually we know GM is trying to do stuff here on pay and progression in these type of jobs. Um, and we strongly think that that should continue. I mean, not least because 50% of the economy work in these jobs uh, and they're vitally important to, to local people, but they're not where narrowing the gap is going to come. We think narrowing the gap comes in the second side of this, okay, the right-hand side of this as you look at it. And that basically plots the productivity distribution across firms that work in the tradable sector. So that is firms that serve national and international markets. And what you can see is that it's here where the really big gap emerges, right? London just has lots of much higher productivity firms in the tradable sector than Manchester or Birmingham, all right? And we think that needs to change. Now, that mention of tradable firms, you can go two directions with that, right? I could mean manufacturing, 
We discussed this a lot in the report. I think it's clear that manufacturing will still have a role to play uh, in Manchester. It will be more important in some parts of the uh, greater Manchester uh, area than others, but we don't think it is central to the catch-up strategy. Uh, and we don't think it's central for the fundamental reason that it doesn't actually employ very many people. And that there is no city across the OECD that has managed a major reindustrialization in the last 20 years. You can try to uh, you know, come up with a strategy that, that's uh, going to suggest about what we might do for manufacturing, how we might grow employment shares. We think that's important. We just don't think that that's where the main action can be. Where we think the main has action has to be is on tradable high value services serving national and local economies. What do we need to do to get firms more productive in those things? We need a bunch of things. All right, so we need firms to invest much more. All right, and this graph here shows on the bottom x axis the, the change in gross value added per job, the change in productivity that we'd like to achieve. And on the y axis, it suggests the increase in capital per job that we would need to see uh, in Manchester to, to underpin that change. How do we get here? Details are in the paper, but it basically comes from doing analysis where we look at the relationship between capital per job, skills, etc., and productivity across the whole of the United Kingdom and figure out what drives what. Okay? So, point one, change needs firm to invest more. Point two is we need the labour force to be higher skilled. Okay? Again, on the bottom here is the change we're trying to achieve, and on the y-axis here is the change in graduate share that we think would need to, be, uh, would need to happen to achieve that. That's 37% of the population with a degree, up to 43%. The report goes into how we might achieve this. All right? So look, I think that upskilling and higher graduation rates from the local population are worthy goals in, in and of themselves, right? Independent of this strategy, I think it fundamentally changes people's life chances, but the report makes it clear that the flow that we get from feasible changes there will not be enough to shift this in the kind of time span uh, that we're talking about here. You need to attract and retain more graduates, okay? So, hugely important what you do for education for your own kids. But the strategy at its heart has attracting and retaining more graduates. To give you a feel for how many, warning, spurious precision point coming up, just over 180,000, okay, is the number that we talk about in the, in the report. The next part of this, and I bet this is going to be possibly the most controversial point, uh, and we can get into this in the discussion, we argue that the kind of activities we're talking about are going to be concentrated in the city centre. Now, this is a story about where we think that private sector investment is going to have to occur if we want to achieve this GVA uplift. There are two parts to this argument. Okay? One part to this argument is that these firms benefit from so-called agglomeration economies, the benefits of being close to uh, lots of other firms doing similar kinds of stuff. All right? You already see how concentrated activity is in the city centre from that left-hand thing, which plots GVA per square kilometre. Now, look, a reaction to that is, oh, my goodness, we've got to spread this out. Right? That is just wishful thinking is what we're arguing here. You've got to play to your strengths. Part of the reason why you've got to play to your strengths is because you are trying to stop the great big sucking sound pulling stuff down to London and the southeast. Firms, by their location choices, are saying the centre is where they want to be for these kind of activities. The right-hand thing gives you the other part of the argument here, which is just jobs there are more productive, right? And you need to play to that strength rather than uh, work against it. The big problem, which is on the x-axis here, is that the city centre employs a low proportion of people in Manchester relative to other places in the productivity advantage that it offers. Okay. How am I doing for time? It's also good, no clock. You're doing medium. Medium, okay. <laughs> um, now here we get to the uh, policy levers that would need to be pulled from a local perspective. And these are going to involve investment across GM, but uh, with a strategy to deepen the pool of labour particularly high skilled and link it into those city centre firms that we're trying to get to invest. All right? So this thing here just breaks down um, how well connected different parts of the city are. One thing we've got to do is improve that all right, through investment in transport. The improvements that we talk about increase the share of existing graduates who are well connected to the city centre from 62% to 70%. You are going to have to do more than that. So the other thing that you're going to have to do is more houses, right, at greater density. 
I, now, whether the city centre is the uh, most controversial point or this is the most controversial point, this is probably not controversial in the sense that everyone agrees we need to do it, but it's possibly the hardest thing to deliver on, all right? Uh, and again, we can get into that. We've got to build them in the right places as well. And you'll see from this, that is not all in Manchester and the centre. It's spread out all over the places. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this for a couple of reasons. In the economist nasty strategy, you know, where I'm just focusing on that, it's to make the place more attractive to high-skilled workers and stop costs pushing up, right? In the other part, where I care about who benefits from this, it is about making sure that lower-skilled uh, existing residents do not lose out, all right? So, uh, what's the scale of the challenge? It's £30 billion pound of extra capital. That's 15% uplift. It's 180,000 more graduates. It's £5 billion on transport, which is £2 billion over what you've already been allocated. It's 126,000 extra homes. It's £350 million <coughs> pound to accelerate house building. And it's £2.1 billion pound in a social housing subsidy to check that the uh, poorest people aren't left out. If we don't get the... Ha Let me just loop back to the housing thing and who's going to benefit, right? If we don't get the housing stuff right... The major losers are the poorer families, all right? So it, it, we absolutely have to get it right. This graph here just shows you uh, Vintils, you know, so 5%, 10%, you know, so you're poor if you're on the left-hand side, you're rich if you're on the right. The, bar, the line here is what happens if we get the housing strategy right in terms of income uplift, which comes from higher wages, more jobs. The bars are what happens if we manage 50% of the housing target. It's too depressing to put, and that's the up, additional. It's too depressing to put these bars on if we don't manage that 50%, all right? The bottom suffer really bad uh, income losses. Right. I hope I've done all right and went as fast as I could. Um, major change is needed, all right? Lots of nuance in the report. I think it has implications for national government, for local government, and it has implications for the people of Manchester, and I'm very keen, uh, you know, in the discussions that we don't lose sight of that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel uh, on uh, how they think we'll face up to those challenges. Great. Thank you, Henry. I think you get a clap. So as you can tell, the report basically says, we don't think it's job done. There is good progress, but it's not job done. Um, not least because if we look at the progress over the last 20 years, it's basically Greater Manchester finishing its period of relative decline, and it's now in a period of keeping up with the country as a whole. That's the big difference between Greater Manchester and, say, Birmingham or West Yorkshire. They've, those two places are still going backwards relative to the UK as a whole. GM has held steady. It's not massively caught up, right? which is why it's not job done, but it has um, stopped this period of relative decline, which is a triumph in some ways. The, um, then the report is setting out, ignoring the spurious accuracy problem, the scale of the change. So don't pretend it's just like, do this one little thing. And then as you, in the same way that it starts from, different parts of the country have different roles to play in the economy. They're all important. Derby's, Derby's role is going to be as a manufacturing centre. Right? Lots of places are. Norfolk is a nice place to live for older people. There, anyone look at the report yesterday from the ONS on people aged over 100? Anyone? You've all got lives, have you? Not fair. <laughs> Good man. Right, OK. Those of you with lives, you've got made the wrong choices. Go and look at the report. What's really interesting is, one, there's hundreds of 100-year-old people now. They're everywhere. But they ain't in Manchester. They're all at the seaside. Right? And that's fine. That is the economic strategy for the seaside. Older, rich people live there. They're not doing any productivity. That's fine. Life's not just about productivity. But GM should be. There. So get on with that. And in the same way that different parts of the country have different roles to play in the national economy, we're emphasising that different parts of Greater Manchester have different, all important, but have different roles to play in the Greater Manchester economy. And you need to make your choices on transport, housing, everything else to reflect that land use. Right, that's the kind of framing. So, Bev, we, it's very easy to write reports. Mm. Well, actually, it isn't always easy, but sometimes it's easy. Uh, the, um, but it is harder to run cities. What's the plan? Um, yes, thanks, Thorsten. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be on a panel that will get me in trouble um, simultaneously with Tracy Brave in, in Yorkshire. You yeah. say they're going backwards and Norfolk at the same time on the seaside. So <laughs> for those live tweeting, it's all Thorsten, not me. Um, but on, on a serious note, I think we in Manchester and Greater Manchester have been, um, I suppose, supportive of the intellectual challenge that comes with a report like this. I think one of the reasons that we find ourselves where we have in Greater Manchester is precisely because we continue to keep internally asking ourselves these questions over and over again. 
Um, so, so and perhaps this is rare these days for a politician, um, but I'm not shy of headlines that say you should be considering this or considering that. So hopefully what we'll have today is a good debate in the round. Um, I think for me, the heart of, of what this report angles at is in many ways um, leads to the question of what kind of city do we want to have in Manchester and a city region in Greater Manchester and what kind of economy do we want to have um, to, to get us there. And I suppose my first point would be not to overlook, um, and you would expect me to say this, the interconnectedness between growth and the conditions of growth. Um, and I'll come on to that later in terms of what I mean. Because actually, for a geography and a demographic like Greater Manchester to simply go after a more productive economy <coughs> without thinking about some of the social and spatial inequalities and disparities that exist within our city and city region means that we wouldn't be equipped um, to be able to have that conversation. So from a city growth perspective, you just have to look around um, outside of this window. Manchester, and indeed Greater Manchester, has changed dramatically in terms of how it appears visually. For those not well accustomed to geography, if you look at those towers over there, um, they're in fact in Salford, so it's not just Manchester that's popping up all of its cranes. Um, and I suppose the other thing I'd say before I get into some of the responses uh, that Henry's flagged is that it is a live political debate and not one to be overstated, where people look at a city like Manchester and they make judgments on the nature of our economy and the nature of our people based on the outside fabric of our buildings. And if you just look at the city centre, it tells a completely different story to a city where, unfortunately, 44% of our kids are still growing up in poverty, a city that, unfortunately, is still the sixth most deprived local authority in the country and the most local, deprived local authority in Greater Manchester. So that story around economics and politicians that make choices on the back of that saying that Manchester has had its fill isn't just damaging to Manchester. But as we can see from this report, it will damage the UK's economy more broadly. Um, so I suppose a couple of specifics from me. Um, and There's lots of, I suppose, interesting stories and captures around some of the progress that we've seen. Um, the first point I'd made is how we've got here has been one of intentionality. We wanted to have a variety of frontier sectors in our economy in Greater Manchester. All the history shows if you predicate your economic success purely on one industry, then you're likely to fail. It means that you're beholden to what the market does or doesn't do. And we see not just going back to our own history with the Industrial Revolution and the struggles that we had following that, but looking at tech and the dot-com bubble, cities that build themselves just on one thing are destined over time to wane. So we wanted to build a diverse economy that focused on the balance between our frontier sectors that we know would drive up productivity over a period of time, but not losing sight of the fact of where the vast majority of Greater Mancunians are employed. And that's why that has to remain simultaneously as important to us as city leaders as much as driving up productivity more broadly. I think, as we've seen, you know, and if you'd have said 15, 20 years ago that Manchester as a city um, and as a city region would have a fintech industry worth £5 billion um, to our economy, that we would have a visitor economy across Greater Manchester worth £9 billion to the economy in terms of GVA, we wouldn't have believed you. So I think that's, that's takeaway number one, that actually, despite holding ourselves a lot to internal challenge, um, to have achieved what we've achieved in a city region without some of the necessary levers that will really drive forward our growth, I think is something not to be sniffed at. And as we've seen that growth, what we see is some of the consequences of success, um, albeit on productivity terms, relative success, um, but you see that, that challenge in the housing market. So we have the challenge not just to build new homes for the new workers that we know we will attract to the city and the city region, but precisely to make sure that we're keeping Manchester and Greater Manchester's housing market moving. In the city of Manchester alone, we've committed to building 36,000 homes, um, 10,000 of which genuinely affordable. And what I would say is that we're based on pragmatism, so we've got a number that we think we can build. Ambitious, stretching, of course, and officers in the room will no doubt nod their heads vigorously, looking at you, Becca. Um, but but what, what I've also said is that if the levers and the conditions change, we could up that number. But we base a realistic figure on stretch and challenge. 
Um, I would add to that, though, some of the other challenges that we see, and it's rightly teased out in the report, around how we utilise land. And I suppose for me, if you think about the city centre and the change that we've had in the city centre, there's a different question that we're always seeking to answer that isn't just in the market of job creation. And that's around how do you create a good and thriving place to live? And I think I would draw attention to, you may look at the headlines of the visitor economy, and you might think that that's purely an economic ploy to get people living in the city. But if over a 12-month period we're opening Factory International at Aviva Studios and Co-op Live, that's not going after a tourist economy, although that's a part of keeping our people in work. That runs to the core of creating a good, thriving place to live. And rarely in economic policy do we talk about fun. Mm. But some of the best cities that you live in across the world are also some of the cities where people have the most fun. And you might not have expected that over a lunchtime presentation, but actually sustainable, inclusive and exciting neighbourhoods are predicated on having more than just simply going to work. And I suppose within that, what I draw its attention, and it comes to the point about us being sustainable, um, as I will no doubt get nudged in a moment. Um, but, but for me, thinking about long-term sustainable growth that sees a drive in our prosperity as a city region, an increase in productivity, but is done in a sustainable way that community infrastructure can cope with. And I think we've got some interesting international lessons from that. So we have places for everyone in Greater Manchester, and we're getting very, very close to having that agreed and signed off to be able to move on. And that meets the challenge around jobs, and it meets the challenge around homes. But the choice to do this in a sustainable way means, and I don't want to pick in a city, but if you look in the report, the productivity growth that a city like Austin has seen, 21% um, that's quoted in its figures in terms of its rise. I visited Austin in March, I don't know, has any show of hands, have anyone been to Austin recently? Um, what you can see there is a city that's gone too far and too fast. Um, I don't run very often, um, you can probably tell. You do um, run, I, I do run, like, but not jogging. Not jogging. Um, on, on a single little half an hour jog around Austin, one morning I counted over 300 people that were sleeping on the streets. And chatting to their mayor, one of the things that they talked about was not having the community infrastructure that could keep up with that. So I think there is a lesson in that, and a lesson that probably I would finish on. That for me, we have a plan in our city region um, that can only be accelerated by support and levers that some people nationally would be able to afford us. So for example, one of the single quickest things you could do to help Manchester's housing market would be to uplift the local housing alliance. Sounds like a very small thing to do in the context of what we're talking about today, but in one swoop you could make an intervention that actually takes the pressure off the bottom and helps us move on sustainably. Or in transport, obviously anyone from Greater Manchester <coughs> won't have missed the fact that we're very excited about our yellow buses that are coming just next week. But we know through economic analysis that every one pound that's invested into our transport system in Greater Manchester delivers three to four pounds in terms of GVA. So actually the return on investment from national government means we have a plan, we have ambition, we have a track record to deliver, but ultimately we still need more levers, more resource and more political will from national government to get us to where we need to be. Great, thank you very much, Ben. key takeaway is that the strategy is to make Manchester even more fun. Exactly, and that's the route to uh, success. The, um, stop the rain, that would help. <laughs> I mean, that can only get might, so far. It might, yeah, I know, it turns out. Who needs an economic strategy? What you need is a weather strategy. Right, that was very subtle. Do you see what she did there? Yeah. Do you see what she did? Do you see what she did? Right, I mean, over to you. Thank you, well, Dawson. Um, afternoon, everyone. So uh, nice to be here and to see you all. Um, I was just going to talk about cranes for 15 minutes, but then Torsten shot my fox, and then now I think it would be a rubbish thing to... No, it wasn't, actually. Um, first of all, thank you for the report, um, for all of those that contributed. I did get through all 111 pages on the train this morning, and I think it is a really serious, helpful contribution to the debate. So it's really welcome that it's been... Uh, published, it's really specific, it's good to engage with, and there's plenty of um, 
uh, food for thought. So fantastic that it has been published. I mean, in a sense, we all, I think most of us can agree on most of this, right? There's lots of good news out there, lots of good things happening in this city region. Um, I was in Salford the other month and was seeing the effects of a 2014 housing investment fund that we set up with the combined authority. It's a 300 million pound loan fund. I think it's true to say that not a single penny of taxpayers' money has been lost, but it's now the money is now being recycled and is uh, the development that is happening as a consequence of that is here uh, in real life and making an impact. And uh, the 185% growth in the city centre population over the last 20 years, and it's just massively impressive. And I think huge congratulations and plaudits need to go to Manchester City Council, to all the members of the combined authority, to Eamon and his team and the mayoral team, because it is it's just a truly well-run, uh, inspiring place, and there's a, a, a clear mission here and, and tons of progress. But it's also true that, by the way, I've never heard anyone say job done. Like, I just don't, like, I just, it's just not obviously, obviously not job done. Um, tons of work still to do. Um, maybe I'm, I'm sort of naturally an optimist, but I sort of think the potential for Manchester and Birmingham and the UK's second cities for the UK as a whole is like discovering some sort of untapped oil reserve, or maybe I need a greener analogy, but you know what I mean. It's, there, is like, there is a massive opportunity here if only we could uh, reach for it and uh, make the most of it. And I was really struck by the finding in the report that whilst it is great that productivity and uh, growth rates in Manchester and the Greater Manchester area are now outpacing London, uh, at current trajectories, it would take us 90 years to get to the same difference as Paris has with Lyon. Now, that, is, that isn't good enough either, clearly. So um, tons, more, uh, tons more to do. Um, what are we doing in the department, and forgive me for being sort of bureaucratic about it and slightly in the weeds, but actually the detail matters on this because I think on most of the high level stuff, jobs, skills, housing, investment, uh, social policy, we agree, right? I don't think there is a huge difference in policy in us. So, so how to take that to the next level and what precisely to do. Um, in uh, March of this year, we agreed the trailblazer devolution deals with GM and, and the West Midlands. I think, although it's always quite hard to prove these things, but I think it's probably the biggest single transfer of power out of central government since either the Devolution Acts of 1998 or, depending on how you look at it, the legislation in 2002 that set up the Greater um, London Authority. Um, what we are doing now is working through the detail, and there is tons of detail to implement it to ensure those powers uh, are delivered. I think one of the single most important parts of that is the single settlement, uh, bringing together a, a single fund for housing, regeneration, transport, net zero, and skills. Um, having done quite a few spending reviews in the Treasury, it's not always easy dividing up the cake, and so good luck. Uh, colleagues in GM, I'm sure they'll do a fantastic job, but it's, um, it's, it's not hard. But we think in the department that GM knows best how to use that capital investment. So getting that done, uh, implementing business rates retention in a whole um, number of growth zones. So there is a greater degree of um, uh, business rates paid in Manchester, retained in Manchester. Um, <laughs> I saw Vernon Everett this morning. I'm, I'm just inspired by the B Network. I just think it's fantastic. I think uh, it looks great. And um, who would have thought that the, well, many of us would have thought that the 2017 Bus Services Act would have had such profound implications. But only now you're starting to see uh, it really happen in real life. And, and that, is, um, uh, that is inspiring. We're working really closely with our colleagues in the Department for Education, the Department of Work and Pensions to what I would say is complete uh, the post-18 skills devolution, so most notably free courses for jobs and boot camps, big deal, uh, and in making sure that GM co-designs employment support programs. They're all technical, it's quite dry, it's quite hard work, but it matters in order for, for this city region to flourish. The final thing we're doing, which 
may or may not be of interest uh, is investment zones, which are um, place specific. They are locally led. We are not coming in from central government and saying, your sector is this, it shall be like that, and uh, the zones should be A, A, B, and C. We are taking a lead from colleagues here and working with them and seeing how we can use central government support to try and make uh, place-based spatial policy work in this locality. It really, I, I hope, to, to us anyway, it feels like a partnership. And uh, to me, that is the model of working going forward uh, with the big city regions such as these. I'll stop. Great. Thank you very much, Will. And then last but not least, Jen. Hello. Can you hear me? Is that working? Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to be here talking about something that has probably preoccupied me one way or another for um, far too long, uh, both at my former employer and my current <laughs> employer. Um, so as a journalist, I was uh, drawn to the line in the blurb of this event that said that the rhetoric has outpaced the reality in Greater Manchester because if I was going to be writing something up, that's probably what would be in the intro. So I thought I would just begin by um, exploring that a little bit in, in my opening remarks. I had um, a bit of mixed feelings, I suppose, when I read that phrase because I've, I have... Um, I've got some sympathy with it, but I also, there's part of me that kind of thinks that you need to put in perspective the progress that Greater Manchester has, has made over the last kind of 25 or 30 years. So um, to perhaps begin with where, to some extent, I agree, um, I mean, I've lived and worked here for over 20 years, and um, there have been occasions in the last few years where I have received press releases that tell me that Greater Manchester is doing the greatest thing that anyone has ever seen in the history of the world anywhere. Better than anywhere in the UK, better than anywhere in any, any city anywhere. And, um, and then I kind of go outside and walk around and think, I still can't get a bus from there to there, um, still can't afford to rent there, you know, and so on. And, and, um, and you know, all of the things that we know that are kind of still um, yet to be sorted out or improved in Greater Manchester. Um, I think actually that that rhetoric has been uh, a component of the success that Greater Manchester can say that it's had to date. I think the rhetoric matters and I think that the um, narrative that's been sustained over the last 30 years probably in Greater Manchester has been part of the reason that there has been a, um, a growth, uh, a, a sustained confidence from the private sector and from central government, governments of different stripes. Uh, looking to work with Greater Manchester um, over that period. So I think you can't kind of underestimate the importance of political language and also consistent, consistent political language. Um, for it to work, it does have to match up in some way with delivery and with a clarity of strategy and a clarity of vision. Um, so, you know, historically in Greater Manchester, you would be able to um, point to the delivery of the Metrolink, such as we've got it uh, so far. And I, I realise the report talks about the fact that transport connections need to be improved. Um, but, I, you know, I'll, I'll come back to actually how difficult it has been to get as far as Greater Manchester has got to this point. Um, but that would be an example of, of something that um, the city region has managed to deliver. Going further back, clearly, you know, there's all the examples that we know about, the rebuilding of Hume, the rebuilding of the city centre after the IRA bomb. Um, and more recently, over the last, last kind of 15 to 20 years, the clarity of regeneration strategy in the city centre, which I think has kind of provided a framework or a space into which the market has been able to kind of come in and, and flourish and achieve, you know, some of the things that you can... Um, see out of the window. There have definitely been points in the last few years whether I've wondered whether that clarity of strategy and courage and delivery has been quite as uh, um, clear or quick as perhaps it had been historically, and I would kind of maybe pull out three things. Um, I don't necessarily know where for sure the Metrolink is supposed to be going next. I know there was talk about Stockport, there was talk about Middleton, Clearly, Greater Manchester doesn't have the funding yet, but you do still need to know where that money would go, right, if you got the funding. So that would be one question that I would suggest, and that is very clearly related to productivity. Perhaps someone in the room can tell me absolutely 100% where the Metrolink is going next, but I don't think that that's the case. Um, the artist formerly known as the Spatial Framework took a very, very long time to get to the point that it is, it, it is at now, and, of course, only nine out of ten boroughs um, got there. It was a very 
difficult political process and if the politics of planning was easy then our national planning system would not be in the situation that it's in now so I wouldn't underestimate the scale of that challenge but in the early days it didn't feel to me as though necessarily top priority and so it took kind of the best part of a decade from the devolution deal to the point that it has surfaced in its current form um, and I've no idea what the clean air zone is really so um, I mean I don't know how whether that necessarily relates back too closely to productivity but I think you know it's a good example difficult decisions if you're going to have a devolved system at some point do 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 have to be taken um, and so I think you know without I which is not me meaning to be kind of overly negative but you can't get into a situation where you're drifting right because that is part of the reason that there has been historically been confidence um, in the city region. Clearly, as the report acknowledges, and as Bev has already said, there's a huge role here for central government. Greater Manchester is not going to be able to do all of these things by itself. It hasn't done all of these things by itself. You know, some of the progress today has also been because it's worked in partnership um, with Greater Manchester. And I completely agree with Bev that um, housing is, you know, the example that I would pull out as well. <coughs> Greater Manchester can't fix the local housing allowance problem on its own. It can't fix the social house building problem on its own. It can't fix the national planning system on its own. And those are all barriers to getting to where you need to, to be. The housing pressures here, I think, are fairly well known already. I think I, you know, I've written something in the FT literally today about the fact that these pressures are not just being felt in the city, but in the outlying boroughs. Um, partly as sort of uh, cost of living pressures have evolved over the last year or so. Um, so uh, I've lost my train of thought, can't think what I was going to say next, but yes, anyway, housing. Um, so Greater Manchester does need, I think, this uh, kind of constructive uh, challenge that's coming through uh, in today's report. And I think that, um, that one of the things that I quite liked actually about Trailblazer deals, which makes me a little bit unusual in this respect, is that I thought it was quite good that there is a kind of clear outcome framework being applied to Greater Manchester in the West Midlands, and potentially also a greater political scrutiny through some kind of select committee, because if Greater Manchester wants to be treated as a peer by central government, which I think should be the goal, because local government in this country has a tendency to infantilise every area, then you should also then expect the same level of challenge uh, and scrutiny as a result. Um, I'm just going to rattle through a few uh, bits of context and perspective, I suppose, which for me are kind of in defence of Greater Manchester. Um, yes, there is clearly still a yawning productivity gap between where Greater Manchester is and where, you know, ideally it would be. Um, and I agree. I don't think anybody's suggesting that it's job done. Um, I don't remember Manchester in the 1980s, I do remember it in the 1990s, and the scale of the change, I think, it, it, you can never reiterate it often enough, you know, the change has been absolutely extraordinary, and the fact that it has taken as long as it has taken, though, to make that, challenge, make that change, is a testament to how difficult that actually <laughs> has been. Um, if you take the development of the Metrolink, for example, there have been so many different permutations of financial mechanisms that Greater Manchester leaders have had to come up with over the decades to keep moving that forward. It had to do deals with the Tories, then it had to do deals with Labour, then it had to do deals with George Osborne, just in order to get each little bit of the network extended, in order to get it as far as it has got. So although, yes, there remain gaps, I think even the fact that Greater Manchester is kind of holding steady, as it were, like, I think, you know, there needs to be some credit for that. Um, on Places for Everyone, Notwithstanding what I said about the importance of sorting out our housing market here, productivity and policy don't exist in isolation from politics. And I wonder how much appetite there will be among local authority leaders in Greater Manchester to reopen that particular can of political worms. Um, I think my final point would be, if we're using London as our comparator, which the report is doing, and which, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to be comparing Greater Manchester to London, because this is, you know, this is, this is kind of the premise of um, what, you know, nationally the issue about regional inequality, that we are over-dependent on London on the South East. If we're using London as our comparator, um, then I think it's also reasonable to ask whether there's a different way to build a city region to um, simply rebuilding London. And if you only look at narrowing the productivity gap in isolation, then um, you know potentially you risk recreating the problems as well as the positives of the capital. Um, and I don't think anybody would want to see some of the problems that London has currently got 
Um, clearly, we would like to see the increased economic activity, but you don't want to. You, you don't want to also do that. Um, so, in many respects, I think Greater Manchester is still a bit of a blank slate. You know, if you were going to try and build a city or a city region from scratch, like there are an awful lot of opportunities here and an awful lot of um, political conversation to, to be had, and I just don't think Greater Manchester should be um, scared to have them. Great, that's brilliant, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, there was loads in there, so let's try and come back to those as we go. Why don't we, I thought in terms of how we're going to structure the conversation, we've got about half an hour. They remember to say you ask questions. Those of you in the room, if you're on Slido, it's hashtag Greater Manchester. They, um, so I thought we'd do a bit about where we're starting from, and obviously we'll try to make it moderately controversial rather than just the easy bits. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and then let's do who benefits, which is where Jen finished there. So how do you have a city where you get the right outcome from that productivity growth, not the ones that you might not want them um, to happen? So that's the plan. The, um, so controversially, I was gonna, on, on like, it's all going really, so everyone talks about Manchester going really well. The, uh, I was gonna controversially, Bev, why don't you take this one? Oh, thanks. So, yeah. it's okay, it's okay. so <laughs> like, who's doing really well on productivity growth in Greater Manchester? Anyone got? Who's the winner? Central Man Manchester itself? Mm. No, they're the levels. But who is growth rate? Come on, you do know the answer to this. Salford. Salford is the winner. Are we sure you're not being beaten, Beth? <laughs> I mean, look, if, if Greater Man I think actually the starting point is different. So there is, I think, a bit of a misnomer around Greater Manchester's economy if you look at where the baseline starts in terms of productivity and where you capture growth versus if you were to go back 10 to 15 years where okay. who already had higher levels. Yes. And I think there's been an interesting piece of work that's shown actually what does productivity look like over the last decade within Greater Manchester. So I think it's fair to say, and I'm speaking here as the leader of Manchester City Council, that for a lot of the time and a lot of measures, Places like Manchester have come from a lower starting point and risen more quickly through some of these mechanisms. So actually, if you think about how productivity spreads across Greater Manchester, there was some reference of Trafford over there. So if you look at places that have been, places like Wigan, areas that for some time have been operating at a fairly high comparative productivity level, that seen some increases. I think we've seen some great moves in Salford, actually, and if you look at their build rate within the last five years versus the ten years before, um, actually you're starting to see a significant change. Ten years ago, would have, we have been talking about um, FDI into Salford in the uh -huh. same way? Probably not, but the likes of Middlewood Locks is only predicated on the basis of foreign capital, but seeks benefit from the city centre. So I think it's always the case um, where your starting point um, and how you measure the benefit. And I think you know this this idea that Manchester, as in the city of Manchester, is is the prime and only beneficiary. Where we see a challenge is the northern band, and I think that's where we've seen um, a stubbornly low growth rate when it comes to productivity um, and when it comes to business growth. And in that northern band, I include the north of my own city. So um, if I think about, I don't know, what residents in Charlestown or Harper Hay in Manchester need, they need a strong Middleton and they need a strong Eldon just as much as they need a strong city centre in terms of places to go and opportunities that are available. So I think it's a simplistic question to say who is the winner in Greater Manchester but the evidence is starting to suggest that this notion of kind of traditional agglomeration that might just trickle down when we fancy it actually is a much more spread out version in Greater Manchester. Great, very right, good. The, um, on, um, Jen, why don't you do this one, which is on, so let's do it on the past. So we're doing on like what's got us to where we are today. If you've got to pick one thing that marks out why GM has done better than others, basically than every other city region, including London in the last 10 years, but every other city region over the 20 year period in ending that decline. Is it the narrative or is it the transport or is it the, what's the, what's the thing that makes, what's the one thing that makes the biggest difference? Um, probably the thing underpinning all of those things that I would jump to is um, clarity and stability of leadership. 
So then that underpins the message, it underpins the direction, it underpins the um, ability to have conversations and make deals with the private sector with, the, with central government. It means that if there's a change of government or if there's turmoil at the top of government, at least there is a constant going on here that knows where it's going. And I would say that both from the political and the officer side as well. Like a, a, a clear idea of where you're going and roughly how you're going to achieve it. Okay. So that's quite a, that's quite a kind of people make a difference having like leadership really matters. Well they do though because if you look at the opposite of that which is what we've had nationally for the last few years then well close your ears <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you think that's not gone well for us if it doesn't feel like it it's not gone, it's not gone well for us I it's not people, gone. I think it's, it's, it's institutions it's like the establishment of the combined authority create an institution that where there could be some leaders I think there. I think I think Jen's Jen's right, and I think I think there's there's something around the political maturity of Greater Manchester. Um, so so I don't know. Let's pick on me as an example. Coming in after my predecessor Sir Richard, that had been doing the job for 25 years, um, beyond the slightly dodgy kind of football analogies and the kind of rhetoric about big shoes to fill. Um, you could have a natural temptation as a politician to try and recreate everything in your own image, but it was important to the stability of the city that we maintained our original 10-year plan and we're going to refresh our 10-year plan for the next 10 years um, at the end of that original 10-year plan rather than just coming in and redefining that. And I think that's the same across Greater Manchester. The premise of Greater Manchester around the fact that we are a fairly visible geographic area that makes sense to people has embedded kind of that decades of political maturity around some of those decisions. That is, uh, that's a great um, uh, answer. The, um, and you definitely, obviously, you see lots of good things. I spend obviously my whole life on trains around the country. You see lots of good things happening in lots of places in the country. You don't see that in many parts of um, in many parts of the country, and that is a that is a big deal. Right, let's kick off on to like <coughs> the strategy, the um, on what we do. So, anyone wants to ask a question about like what the economic strategy is? Again, raise your hand. Very good. Let's get. We'll get your mic in a second. But the um, so one thing that's I was gonna. So we're gonna we're aiming to make this not completely like everybody agrees. Okay. So let's do the fun Manchester bit, which Bev raised. Okay. So hands up in the room if you think Manchester is fun. <laughs> Look at that. See? You're so loyal. You're so loyal. I think the data basically does suggest that Manchester is fun, partly for all the youth you've got at these universities and all that. But, um, but basically because you've got a really booming tourism and leisure industry, <coughs> and that can be part of attracting people to live in a really successful city. So you definitely want bits of that. But there's definitely dangers in cities becoming tourism and leisure hotspots. Because tourism and leisure, I, I said Norfolk earlier, right? But there's some activities that can happen anywhere in Britain. Well, we've got lots of pretty places. People can go and do tourism there. We want that. I like that. It's good. Keep going. Right. The, um, like, countryside, for example. OK? The, the countryside, for example, isn't going to host the highly productive uh, activity that can happen in Manchester city centre. Yeah? The, um, and so I think that is, so if you, and if you look at cities that become very tourism yeah. focused, they are not high productivity cities. They might be really fun cities, like Liverpool is definitely in this danger bucket. Lisbon, we've got some Portuguese members of the team. Mm. Lisbon not been going so well recently. Traditionally the highest productivity bit of, watch well, it is the highest productivity bit, but it's not seen any productivity growth in the last 20 years as it becomes a tourism hotspot. You can still make money from it, but it's not a highly productive place it's probably not a great place to live I mean, so there is a tension here between is GM strategy to be just really fun so everyone loves coming for a weekend here Liverpool kind of heading in that direction a bit there where's Alan in the room he'll tell me off in a second but anyway sorry Alan like, but basically like people you know when people start writing including in the Financial Times that you can spend your weekend in Liverpool They've already wrote Lisbon for the last 20 years, but they're now writing the report. Then you, that will happen. I've not it, written that. I didn't say you'd written it. Oh, right. the, uh, the FT's been going for a while. I hear they have many journalists. Oh, right. uh, they have, uh, I was just checking. I'm okay. intrigued. I, I've not read that one from you. Anyway, so Beth, go on, Beth. Why don't you, how, how much fun and any, yeah. any dangers of fun? Because they're all loving it. They just love it. But no, are you no, sure no, we should? But, but I, I think as a key tenant of it being a great place to live, that, that's the context. Um, and yes, of course, actually, you know, the evidence shows that as we grow, Manchester is a reputable place to come. Yeah. Actually, the evidence goes hand in hand that people will be more likely to relocate the business here. So there's something around the buzz of a city, making it enjoyable. And when I speak to particularly large international firms that have chosen Manchester 
over other places to relocate to. It's predicated on the basis of quality of life, um, housing affordability, the supply of talent, but also a place that they would like to um, encourage their resident, their um, workers, sorry, to relocate to. Um, regulation of Airbnb, I think, would help um, in terms of thinking in cities, some of the issues around kind of control over the sector. And I think one of the things that we've done in Manchester um, as the first UK city um, to, to do so with some others quickly following um, is around using, um, it's not quite a tourist tax, but it's using a business improvement dis district, which essentially takes a contribution um, from hoteliers with their consent. And the reason that I mention that is that there is a temptation for um, politicians to ask of central government, particularly when we talk about local tax raising powers, there is a temptation to think of a tourist tax as a solution to all problems. But a tourist tax shouldn't be something that's subsidising a transport network. It shouldn't be something that's subsidising a basic infrastructure. It should be something based on additionality. So, okay. um, fun place to live. Um, we're not in the market of attracting stag and hen dues for the weekend. Though. You don't want that. I've um, got some family in York. <laughs> it's, dark. it's dark on a Saturday night. People. Can I just <laughs> add something cool. on that as well? Um, having a fun city, probably part of graduate retention as well. Um, yeah. As I'm, yeah. I'm probably a bit unusual of my generation that I went to uni here and stayed here. Like most people I knew, left. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, it's much more common now, isn't it, for somebody yeah. to come to uni and think I'm just. And got these, yeah, you're yeah I think we're on about 55% of both well. Manchester University. Right now, I just want to get um, a few more questions in. Is it on the economic strategy, sir? Promise me. I'm high trust, so oh, go. Martin. Yeah, go, Martin. I think so. um, I'm just wondering how much difference it makes what we're producing. There was a time when Manchester was leading in music, in particular, and that seems to have faded. Uh, drama, those sorts of things, intangible. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so like you worried that we're not, we were like cultural leaders, yeah. and now you've become bankers. Is that what you worry about, Martin? <laughs> I can see, I can see that worry see that the, um, so well, let's broaden it out slightly into this which sectors point and we won't take this because and Bev you did touch on this in your remarks which is so in general when you go around the country talk in fact when you go around countries and talk to people about their economic strategies in general what people want to talk about is which sectors they are going to focus in right that's all, all and then they always say the same things which is my place wherever the place is is going to be doing digital bit of finance biotech it's going to be a biotech center they, they always say the same things even if they don't know what biotech is and they've never met any business doing it right mm -hmm. everyone wants to name the sectors and i understand that because political communication requires that one of the arguments of this report is like that's a terrible way to make an economic strategy for a city this big it's not a bad strategy for birmingham for a derby right right it's, it's it's got like one industry and it really needs to keep it because there's no other plausible route to success. Yeah, those that haven't been to Derby, it's like aerospace, right, and defence stuff. The, um, but that isn't the case for GM. Yeah. So look, the the report argues that we want to just focus on the horizontals, not on some sector specific thing, and it, it comes from a couple of things. So first, you know, my involvement in the city goes back 2007, eight. You know, Richard Howard Bernstein, the Manchester Independent Economic Review. The, well, something I always remember from the beginning of that is that uh, they, they, they had the list of strategies that they thought were going to be, you know, were going to drive it. And the problem was that when you actually looked at the data, it didn't have a productivity advantage in any of them. Um, I just think, you know, these, these sector targeted strategies are just too difficult. You haven't got the political levers and you don't really know. No, you don't really know where the strengths are and what you should do about it. So I, I think that focusing on the policy levers that you can pull uh, and then letting the people and firms that are out there make their decisions, you know, about what they're going to do is important. Now, look, you know, at the margins, it's fine to have sector specific bits of this and that, you know, so uh, it's fine, for example, if you think, well, advanced textiles might be important for some parts of Greater Manchester. And I'm going to have a bit of the strategy which talks about advanced textiles. Right. I'm going to have a bit of the strategy which worries about what our R&D innovation spend should be on, because I would like that R&D innovation spend to be moving us into more advanced manufacturing, because that's going to benefit a particular part of the workforce. I, you know, I, I really don't mind having sector-specific bits, but I think they're marginal. They're not at the centre. 
And I think that one of the dangers with the industrial strategy, as we had it previously, there was a distraction from Mir and the Shared Prosperity uh, Review, both of which I was involved in, was it started getting a bit sector specific. By the way, it's exactly, the, it was similar to the point about tourism. See, I think tourism strategy is terrible. I think the, the conversation needs to be about what amenities you want, right? Because once you start having amenities, you realize that it's not just about fun. Actually, far more important than fun is whether your kids will get a decent education from your schools, whether your air is breathable. These are about right? being defun. You want, you yeah, want, but that's really, you, but, you know, the pops. report, the report, and parks. You know, so I'm just saying, it's again. So I'm not saying don't have fun, but you want to think about fun as one amenity alongside a whole bunch of things that people really care about. Jen mentioned the clear air zone. You know, I would be worrying as much about that as I would be about fun. So I think. I'm, I'm just sort of okay. Very good. Horizontal. This gentleman's really nodding on, I, but like avoiding bad. Can I just, just to give you a bit of controversy? I know you like controversy. I do like it. Life's too short. Um, I, I suppose the the reality is is that a lot of this is we've had to bring businesses to Greater Manchester, and when you go and speak to businesses, they ask for your specialism. They ask of a politician, "What do you know about life sciences?" When I was traipsing around a biotech factory when they showed you precisely what it was in words that I didn't quite understand they demand of places actually that high level information so I think when we focus on the specialisms that's what's driving it the reality of doing business um, and I wouldn't want you to think that a great place to live doesn't mean that we're not expanding in the city of Manchester are just under 150 parks and green spaces and you know looking at the list 443 meters walk within every park in Manchester for every resident. So all of this stuff is in the round. Um, so I'm not just a politician of fun. No, 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 we're not doing that. Fun. That's they're never been said about me in my life. So right. gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm taking it, I'm taking it. Which bit? What's not never been said? That you're a the politician fun, of fun? The fun bit, yeah. Fun ish. Right, let's get a microphone down here a second while we um, uh, give everyone else a question. Mm. Jen, do you want to take this on? Because given that you've raised your personal history of coming here 20 years ago and mm. sticking there when it was really fun, when Martin was enjoying his kind of nightclubs and his cultural, <laughs> cultural youth, but your low productivity cultural youth, Martin. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the question, the question from the interweb. Mm. The, uh, I'm not, it doesn't mean it's bad. Stop judging. I'm just saying factually low productivity. Okay. Right. So the question is: Do local northern universities, so let's just do Manchester one to keep it simple, have the capacity to resources to train up the 180-ish new graduates over this say two dec decades, or basically is it going to be loads of people moving in? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head what capacity Northern Universities both. have got. I imagine it will be a bit of both, won't it? It will yeah. be a bit of both. And also, do you know what graduates sometimes include? Foreigners. Foreigners. <laughs> Often, actually. Because whenever people say zero, like people say it's zero sum across Britain, they say the graduates here being productive, then they're not being productive somewhere else. So the country as a whole hasn't got richer, you just move the people around, which is like complicated, let's not get into it. But the reason it's not true is one, because you can train up some more people, and two, foreigners exist. I know it's hard to remember that, but it's true. Um, yeah, sorry to keep it these, short and sweet. How, how, well, tell us about, we have, well, the report doesn't do much on like how central the universities are to Greater Manchester. Anyone well, walking around it nowadays would be like, oh my god. Well, they're also, I mean, they're also driving the housing market in town as well, right? I mean, you know, some of the accommodation that has been being mm. built in the city centre over the last few years are very much catering to uh, international students, international graduates, and so on and so forth. And actually part of the pressure on the Manchester housing market already is the fact that there isn't enough space for the students that we that, that we need to accommodate which you know indicates that there is clearly retention happening and growth happening but maybe as a city and may, maybe city region it, we're not actually keeping pace with that with right. that level of demand you've got to build some stuff guys right sir give us your name as well uh, Harry Fraser Department for Working Pensions um, I just wanted to know um, Henry touched on the idea of the importance of housing and how it must be kind of more affordable whilst private investment occurs. Is there a danger that private investment can outpace it in Manchester if you know the difficulties that Will mentioned with you know a centralised kind of idea of improving affordable housing over the UK? <coughs> is there this danger that you know visibly there's a lot of investment in Manchester? It's quite clear to see. Could it lead to more clustering of deprivation in other areas? like the other urban centres which people rely on in, say, North Manchester? Okay, that's a, good, that's a really good question. Then let's use that as our pivot to who wins in a second. Then. I, I don't want to miss, we have loads of great questions. So there's only one for Bev on the strategy I'm going to come back to. 
could we cock up, basically? The answer is yes, we could. Many places have done that. We shouldn't do it. But Bev, the question for you from online, from John Pearson, is uh, if you had five billion quids to spend on one thing in... You're not going to, don't worry, but uh, so this, is, this is abstract. But if you did have five billion pounds to spend, what would you spend it on? Basically, what's the top priority? Transport, housing, uh, big shiny statues. <laughs> um, look, look. Communists used to love it. <laughs> it's a good job I'm not a communist, isn't it? Um, That's one of the many reasons it's a good job you're not a communist. <laughs> the statues aren't the main reason. The like murder, expropriation, the other problems are also. It always takes a pass, doesn't it? Right. Um, so I, I think I think thinking about the things that we're in control of now and sit within our responsibilities, um, then actually transport because there is um, a significant gap between where we want to go and get people to versus the reality at the moment. Um, and I think housing is, is certainly up there in terms of the ability to subsidise affordable housing that isn't currently there um, in terms of capacity. And it's worth saying that, and that will require central government. Yeah. There's no way we're seeing significant increases in uh, social house building in Manchester without uh, things. Why don't we turn that then to you, and then we're going to move on to who benefits on... So the single pot, so just one money, which uh, I'm slightly worried we've mentioned it a few times, even used the word trailblazer, which sounds exciting, but I bet half... I'm not sure everyone knows what it is. I mean, I'm kind of work on this as a job and some bits of it still aren't very clear. So on the single pot, so someone's asked Bev what would she spend the money on. Yeah. Is central government really going to stop having a view on how money should, where money is spent in Greater Manchester? They'll set your, your like, have our new accountability framework mm. with some, like, objectives for Greater Manchester to achieve. Like, are you going to be able to cope with the chillaxing, no longer having a view? Well, I, well, I think it, I think it, it is worth a moment's context on the local government finance settlement, where obviously there is always a debate about the quantum. Mm -hmm. But the local government finance settlement, uh, largely, as you'll know, is spent on adult social care, children's social care, um, and other forms of pressures, is is in, in the order of sixty billion pounds a year. Uh, and here, the single settlement is. Um, is a much smaller uh, amount than that. But what my point is, we trust local authorities to deliver an awful lot, and they, you know, by and large, do it very, very well in some very difficult circumstances. So can and should central government trust the Greater Manchester Combined Authority to know best on the precise splits between retrofit, housing, skills, and transport in which years? Then, yes, absolutely, it, it should. And we're happy when people. So let's let's not talk about GM because that will get like personal, awkward. They will love GM. But like, you've done this for you're doing this for um, the West Midlands and GM yep. at the moment. In theory, other places would like the same deal, yep. right? West Yorkshire, mm -hmm. even South Yorkshire. Okay. Now, what it, if someone just makes terrible decisions? Do you promise to stay chillaxed? They spend all the money on the statues. Is central man, is that you're going to then say, uh, we've, uh, we've marked you against your accountability framework and you are not hitting your productivity or other targets, it's suboptimal, but are you going to stay chillaxed? So we'll, well, we will publish all the detail shortly on exactly how the settlement will work. Oh, wait, 0 to 10, how chillaxed are you going to stay? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to read all this bollocks about it, marking stuff. No, 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 no it, it, this, is, this, is, this is hard and it obviously... 0 to 10. No, not really. it's, um, I reckon it's going to be... A, I reckon you're going to stay... Ten is really chillax. I reckon we can get to seven, and then when something really bad happens, uh, you'll fall well, down I don't to think three. That, I think the local government finance system is quite a good comparator, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean it's a slight red rug, so okay. be careful. Can we please not? We haven't got time to discuss the local government financing settlement, because they're going to kill themselves at the back. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and Ben's going to lose it as well, and then bad, bad, bad. Then, right, okay. Who wins? We're, we're massively over time, yeah? But you don't always get what you want particularly if I'm chairing. So we're, so we're going to do who wins. I don't want to finish earlier. So housing is a really good way into it, because Henry showed you that chart showing you that housing <laughs> makes a massive difference to the, the, the productivity gains will feed through to wage gains. I think we should be confident about that, even if you're not a crazy neoliberal, and I'm looking around, there's not many of them left anymore, anyway, apart from this trust. Um, uh, there's not many of them left. But in general, we should be confident that if Manchester gets more productive, wages will rise for most of workers. In, but, but, but we won't. But incomes won't rise for everybody. Why not? Because not everybody works for lots of very good reasons. Yeah. They, um, but their housing costs will rise in line with productivity. So is it, Henry? If you're, like, is housing the biggest problem on the who wins, or there, is there another one you want to highlight for people? 
No, I think housing is the biggest problem and who wins. Je- Jen said it, right, which is that the really difficult decision is how do you do this stuff without recreating the problems of London. Uh, I mean, there is a really brutal answer to that, which is that if you just viewed it from a national strategy point of view, you might not care. I mean, I'm just saying, right, you could say, well, actually, London is paying for all these public services. And, so, I mean, it's, and, you know, fine, it's terrible for people who have really, you know, poor housing outcomes and low prices or whatever. But Manchester is so important to the national strategy of Britain that we should do it anyhow. Right? And the way be, you do it have to be a very cunning secret. Okay. No, no, but I'm just saying the way you do it anyhow is just not to build any housing and you allow the market to price poorer residents out. Now, personally, I think that's terrible. Right, just to be clear, so please don't take the first part of that without the second, right? There is a reason why I have been campaigning for planning reform and the need to increase the supply of housing, including building on the green belt in London, because I think that is the only feasible route to doing it. So I think it's a choice, but I do actually think the ha- I do think the housing, think housing is absolutely front and centre and the analysis shows it. If you don't do the housing, the real income gains at the bottom are probably negative because you are, as Jen said, recreating the problems of London. So I think we've got a choice. My personal choice is we should try and do something that offers GM enough powers and money that we can do the housing stuff alongside the other stuff that we're going to do. Because I think the other route is just not conscious, however you said that thing. Conscionable. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. Now, <laughs> the, um, one way of putting that is that what the report is basically arguing for is that central government needs to cough up the cash, the investment for the capital sides of this and the local leadership needs to embrace the continue I should say continue to embrace the change right because it is a lot of change that Manchester would go through Greater Manchester would go through and the deal is empowered leadership with the resources to do it or should be to deliver the transport to deliver the housing to make it a success that isn't just recreating London and in exchange you need the empowered leadership that basically because that politics of that is hard so one thing I was going to say is we did a whole weekend here as a deliberative exercise bits of the team here uh, and one in um, in Birmingham, going through with residents. We had lots of time talking to these kind of people. We did a whole weekend with residents on what they wanted, or they thought about this, the likely path of plausible growth, they, um, which was great and full of loads. That's what the video you, some of you saw at the beginning was from. Now, without going to all of it, the big discussion was about a, like a deep ambiguity about like thinking that the status quo, low wages compared to lots of the country, fewer opportunities for young people coming through in some ways, wasn't great and it'd be better if it went good but then a lot of nervousness that, about uh, what well, people would use the word inequality or poverty mm. i'm going to come back to that in a second because those are different things they're um, but worrying that it makes that kind of thing worse so my final question to wrap up on the winners and losers from all of this okay but here's um, but maybe, maybe we can let you off answering this because it's not fair but like um because you'll have to say both but the most likely scenario for a more productive manchester assuming you build the housing right so assuming you do the housing which will have to at some point not just be in Salford and Manchester but will have to be in Trafford and other places that currently are refusing to build it hello Stockport there um, uh, you will have to then if you but let's assume we do all that so the politics is overcome people decide they want that because they've met someone called young people at some stage okay then um, what's most likely to happen most likely is that inequality is slightly higher yeah you've got more rich people rich-ish people. I don't mean like, you're not going to get Jeff Bezos, we might do, but it's unlikely. They're, um, but you will have more higher income people compared to the country as a whole, right? They're the people that will work in these kind of offices. And there aren't many of those in northern cities at the moment. Right? They're very equal places, even though it doesn't feel like that because you've seen the cranes. But poverty, which is about the level of income right at the bottom, is likely to be lower because your employment rate will be lower, your wages at the bottom will be higher, and if we've done the housing right, you haven't pushed down. Right? So prosperity is higher. Everybody's a bit richer. Inequality, people are looking deeply confused. Sorry about this, guys. Right? Inequality's gone up a bit because everybody's got a bit richer, but we've got more rich people in the city who are currently living somewhere else, like abroad or London right? or Buckinghamshire, wanting to kill themselves. They're, they're, yeah. But poverty is down because you have raised the income of poorer households. It's just, it just hasn't gone up as much as the richer households. Now, I would say that from the deliberative exercise, people are, like, obviously, they, don't, they have no idea. They, they have no idea what I just said, but they um, reasonably, but people are ambiguous about that. And the thing that's marked Manchester out so far is that, and this goes to your narrative point, which is like, there is a vision. It is, to, it is basically to, to get that. And lots of other cities, they don't have that. And the leadership is a bit like, oh, God, like, I can't possibly think about that. It's really scary, right? I don't, I don't want it. 
I don't want the prosperity because if someone says the inner court is going to go up at all, it's just way too scary. So let, and that, it doesn't mean that will definitely happen. The more houses you build, the better. Central government coughs us up for the social housing, do it. That will also help. Um, but probably you end up with higher inequality and lower poverty. Our view is that that's a good deal. That's the deal worth having because Britain needs that. Poorer people in Greater Manchester uh, need that. The North West needs that. But some people won't like seeing some yuppies on the streets. I mean, I don't like seeing yuppies. But sometimes that's what happens. So, Jen, <laughs> is it worth the is it worth the trade up? Well, I think historically Manchester's been quite a magnet for sort of Cheshire set Wales football. Oh, it's pure Wednesday. prejudice coming in here. It's true. They all so lived in we're Hill, kind of used to it. How are you on it? Are you, what, what, you are allowed to answer because you're not running for office. Do you want the deal? Do you want the higher inequality but the higher po lower poverty? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Good. You're in for the deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, look, she answered the question. <laughs> no one ever answers this question. I'm not running to be elected. As that does help. <laughs> that does help. The, um, I think I kind of need to be running to be elected in order to answer. It's quite a political question, but I, I, I don't know that you quite have the trade-off is quite as. Here we go. Here we go. It's, <laughs> it's not really a choice, though, is it? It's not really a kind of take it or I think it's, one or no, time. The way I think about it is, is it the most likely outcome from adopting this strategy? Yes. So should you be content should with that be. being the outcome? rather than, Some people would literally choose to yes. just don't go for the prosperity. Just keep, keep your inequality right. down. Everybody's basically a bit poor, but, uh, but I'm happy with that. Some people definitely say that. We, we, of course we should go for prosperity and productivity in Greater Manchester and be mindful the whole time about the impact that has on the entire city, city region. I think that is, is possible for policymakers okay. to do both. Do you want to speak into this issue? Yeah, no, no, and indulge me for a second. So, so we talk about consistency of leadership um, and we obviously give ourselves credit in Greater Manchester as politicians, but if the public didn't buy into that, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be a popular narrative we would be able to maintain. The reason the public in Greater Manchester and the city of Manchester, if they didn't like growth, they would kick Labour Party out at consecutive elections and we wouldn't have 88 out of 96 Labour councillors on the city council. The bit that's important is that actually, and I want to brag, but, but there's a serious... No, I just said it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, the, the serious point in that actually is that you have to be seen to be striving to do yep. both. Um, and the reason that I give, um, I, it's underplayed the role of civic pride. My residents don't elect me to go abroad and say, hey, do you know what, guys, 44% of our kids live in poverty. It's really grim in Manchester. We're trying our best. They have at least politically communicated to them opportunities and hope for the future. And I'll just throw in one stat. Um, we haven't had the benefits of the London Challenge programme in schools, which saw significant money flow from government into schools. What we've had is 13 years of austerity in this city. And for the first time, we're now able to call it a trend that consistently, year after year, our kids, the sixth most deprived local authority in the country, are achieving at above the national average and above the North West average. That's the first time in the city's history that that's happened. And that's because... We perhaps live in a country where the social co contract is no longer clear, but you build that social contract with your residents that says we will try our very best to reduce poverty. We will also do that by increasing prosperity and we'll never forget of all of the social stuff that we have to do in between. So as, as a Labour politician in a city like Manchester, you have to go after both. That's very good. And that's a really important, actually. One thing that did come out from the deliberative exercise was that next generation thing. It was like, we'd like the prosperity, we're not happy about the higher inequality. And people would use the word poverty, but they meant But, but they never describe themselves as that. No, no, they don't. That's, They're that's worried about the city and how it feels. Precisely. Totally, yeah. Yeah. But they were really keen on the, mm. the next generation will have more opportunities because it's a because the city had those opportunities, they don't need to move away, all the stuff. So that was definitely, I should have said that, that was very uh, clear. Let's do a vote amongst the punters, that's you, uh, and then we're gonna wrap up. So who is for, no more growth in prosperity, but we don't get the yuppies, so inequality <laughs> doesn't go up, anyone. One of you is, you're lying, I don't believe you. Someone must be in favor of it, no? We did this in, in Birmingham last week, the majority were for the no prosperity. None. Yeah, I did at that point lose my rank. <laughs> you haven't recorded this, have you? This is recorded, yes. This is, uh, transparency is important. <laughs> I'm going to have to send him a lot Accountability of Accountability and transparency of are really important. The majority voted. They were so nervous about the higher inequality that they did not want the prosperity. Okay, well, let's let you vote. Who wants the prosperity and the future generations having a chance in exchange for a few more yuppies? <laughs> there you go. 
That is what success for a city looks like. It won't just be fun, <laughs> it will be better. Right, on that happy note, can we all thank the panel for all their thoughts today? Thank you all for uh, coming. If you vaguely enjoyed that or were traumatised by it, there'll be more. On the 4th of December, we're launching the entire Economy 2030 Inquiry Final Report. It's a massive book. Got to write it in the next month. Come along. We'll see you there. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good day. Go and build a great city.